Like with that cool music, I should be busting a move of some sort. <laughs> Don't quite pull it off. Yeah. If it ever happens, though, that would be something, wouldn't it? Hey, listen, I wanted to let you know uh, last week for all of the members who participated in our council selection, uh, you selected uh, Emmanuel Bradley to serve uh, for a term on council. Can we just welcome him to the table? And uh, I'm so grateful for his willingness to serve and, and look forward to uh, the next three years together. Uh, we're in, continuing our series in Matthew. And we're in chapter 12, if you're keeping track. This is our 21st week in Matthew's Gospel. And uh, we're going to begin in verse 38. And by the way, this is really uh, some unusual text to tackle. The, this, these are the verses pastors would rather avoid, if we could, when it comes to uh, preaching God's Word. But this is how it starts out. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, that's Jesus, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'd like to start by thinking about a, a premise this morning that might prove interesting uh, and, quite honestly, complicating. Demanding proof can be a way to avoid commitment. Demanding proof can be a way to avoid commitment. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked to see a sign, which is interesting because they'd already seen Jesus do a number of healings and bring freedom to people who were struggling with significant bondage. They literally saw blind people have their eyes open so that they could see, and people who were unable to speak utter their first words. They literally saw people who had hands that were unable to function be completely restored and healed, like they'd seen all of this, and yet it was not enough for them. They'd witnessed miracles, but they were not convinced. What they wanted was not just evidence, what they wanted was proof. Proof. Um, God calls us to a model of relationship that actually requires faith. And I understand our desire. Our assumption is that we would be a lot more confident in our faith if we really didn't need any faith. That if I just had it all nailed down and there could be no doubt, and this is what we really wrestle with and, and would prefer. What's interesting to me is that we don't do this with other things in our lives. We don't require proof for lots of other things. For example, right? did you require proof that your, purse, that your spouse would live as long as you do and love you as much as they do and would always be for you as long as you both shall live? No, you, you made promises to each other, but that's not the same thing as proof. And we don't require proof for children. Before we are parents, we're actually terrified at the prospect of children, and that's because we see other people's children. It makes us very anxious. And what proof do you have that if you have a child that's going to grow up to be a competent, loving, and kind human being? You don't have any proof. Didn't stop us from having kids, did it? We just went ahead. When you buy a car, you don't know how many miles it will last. You don't know that you'll never be in an accident. You don't know if you'll like it 12 months from now. But we will make commitments of 60 or more months on payments just to have something that has a warranty that lasts about a year. And how about your house? 
Is there going to be any maintenance issues that show up? Could there be any accidents that occur? We buy houses and cars and have children and get married without any proof. But when we come to God, we would prefer a proof model. And Jesus responds to, uh, to this fairly strongly. And there's probably good reason for that. It's quite a few weeks ago now, but if you remember the day that Jesus came out of his own waters of baptism, he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was going to be tempted of the devil. Do you know what three conversations they had that still rang in the ears of Jesus? They were proof-based conversations. If you're really the Son of God, then do this. And what Jesus knew is you can't live the life you were created for if you're constantly trying to prove to other people who you are. And so Jesus, he knows what the source of this kind of proof-based requirements in order to make a commitment comes from. And he has some words, and they're not very flattering. He says, the generation that demands proof are noted for two things. One is they're wicked. Now, I know uh, sometimes in our culture, that term wicked can be used in a positive light, but it, didn't, it wasn't a positive light here. And it means to actually have intentions to do something harmful to someone. And if you remember even a couple weeks ago, we know the Pharisees have already made a determination, a decision to destroy Jesus because he didn't agree with their interpretation of the controversy about the Sabbath. And so wicked, they intend harm, and then adulterous, which means that you are the kind of people who break your promises. You enter into covenants, but you don't keep them. And your demanding proof is looking for the loophole that justifies what you are about to do. Then he says this, the only sign you will get is the sign of Jonah. And he tells them, even as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a large fish, so the Son of Man, that's a reference to himself, it's, it's the favorite way Jesus has of referring to himself, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is before the trial of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, or the resurrection of Jesus. So they have absolutely no idea. This is a riddle to them. They don't know what Jesus is talking about. Let's continue on the conversation a little bit. The men of Nineveh, now this is a direct reference to Jonah, and I'll come back to that in a second, will stand up at the day of judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south, if you don't know, that's a reference to a famous queen in antiquity known as the queen of Sheba. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. She actually made a trip in the ancient world that was over 2,500 miles long. They had no airplanes. To came and listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. Nineveh was a wicked city. And when I say that, I don't just mean that their behavior was out of bounds and we wouldn't approve. I'm talking about the kind of cruelty that when people do it today, they are accused of crimes against humanity. They preyed upon anyone weaker than themselves. The last thing you wanted to be was the weakest person in your own house. The last thing you wanted to be was the weakest person on your own street. The last thing you would want to be is the weakest person in your neighborhood. They were always looking for ways to prey upon them. They treated people with the kind of cruelty that they would take life from them in any possessions that they had. And if I were to go into all of their atrocities today, it would sicken us. It would turn our our stomachs. And Jonah was sent by God to preach against that city and to tell them that if they did not repent, they would in fact be judged by God. And Jonah actually, when he heard that word from God, went in the opposite direction. He was not the least bit interested. He didn't like them. In fact, you could say that he was prejudiced against them. The last thing 
Jonah wanted is for that city to be saved. He thought they should get what they deserved. Their reputation was well known. And through a series of events, he winds up preaching and, and his message is not very long, but it's very convincing. And from the king all the way down to the least, the entire city repented and God spared the city. Now, the queen of Sheba was a queen that came out of the area that is now known as Ethiopia. And she came 2,500 miles just to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And of course, to, to have uh, established some kind of a trade route. Uh, they had a lot of spices and things that they would like to sell. Israel had lots of things that they would like to sell. And so this was an economic summit of some sort. But she'd also heard about the wisdom of Solomon. And she came with a bunch of hard questions. And she was so impressed that in sources outside of Scripture, it indicates to us that she actually became a believer in the God of Israel. And so she returns home a changed person. Once again, Matthew insists on something that can miss our attention. We, we might not notice it. And that is, he insists on calling attention to outsiders that are included. Ninevites were not considered the people of God. The Queen of Sheba was not considered a person of God. And yet, God keeps insisting on including people that other people don't include. How many are glad we serve a God who does that? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so uh, this is what's interesting. Do you know how many miracles Jonah performed? None. He did survive a rather traumatic uh, fish swallowing event. But uh, outside, of, and I don't know what he looked like uh, when he came out of that situation. I'm sure it would have hit social media today. Uh, but he saw, he, he performed no miracles. And the Queen of Sheba saw no miracles. But they listened to the wisdom that they heard. And they responded. And the Pharisees had seen miracles. But the one thing they weren't doing, they weren't listening. And if you don't listen, you don't ever really respond. So a fair question to ask yourself. When God's word is being declared, are you listening? Are you listening? Do you require proof before you will listen? to what Jesus says. Uh, let's continue on. This, now the, the story gets a little strange. Uh, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through an arid place seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. Well, in football, we would call this piling on. A, a referee would blow his whistle and throw a flag, and the team would have to back up uh, 15 yards. What is Jesus saying here? And this is really interesting because Jesus acknowledges that our lives can be improved by some kind of connection with religious reform. That by hanging around people who have a, a different, if not higher set of values, that we wind up seeing our lives mildly improved. In fact, people use the phrase, right? I, was, I got my house in order. I cleaned up my act. And so they seem to to improve their situation in life. The challenge is, is that you can get your house in order and clean up your act and still have a very hollow and a very shallow life. That it is possible to spend our lives actually not living the life God planned for us, but watching other people live their lives. And so we can watch comedy and we can watch tragedy and we can fill our lives from everything from A to B, but not to Z. We watch other people live their lives and we fill our minds with their thoughts. And this has always been a temptation for people, but thanks to little devices like this, I can go a whole day and never have a thought or do one single thing that counts as 
living a real life. Very distracting. Very distracting. Empty lives may be filled with things that we don't want, we don't like, and we can't escape. And that's Jesus' concern for the Pharisees. They look good on the outside, but they're empty on the inside. And before it's all said and done, they'll actually be worse off than the way they started. Empty lives wind up becoming worse. So how do we keep our lives filled? That's a good question and one worth considering. Paul would write to the church in Ephesus and he would say this, keep being filled with the Spirit. And then he makes these recommendations on how to do it. He says, speak to, another, speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That when we put God's word and God's truth on our lips and we share that with other people, it's not just an encouragement to them. It also does something to fill us up on the inside. And sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Now, I know not everyone thinks that they have a great voice, but you have a voice and your voice matters. And when you lift your voice in praise to God, it's not just filling him up. Something is happening to fill you up. And then he says this, always give thanks to God. Always give thanks to God. See, this is what I think happens. Well, okay. I will tell you what's true about me. I am not an extrovert. I do not like being the center of attention. It took me decades to get used to standing here. And I'll let you know when that moment occurs. <laughs> Still working on that. And when it comes to worship, like the thought will go through my, my head. Just raise your hands and, and declare something good about God. And, 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 and my shoulder will twitch like it's going to happen. And then I go, oh, I wonder what, wonder what someone will think. Don't answer, but has that ever happened to you? Or if I lift my voice, I wonder what someone will think about how I sound. Or I wonder if someone will think that I'm calling attention to myself. I wonder if someone will think that I'm trying to, here's the word, prove something to someone. And all of these thoughts neutralize us. And we wind up not saying or sharing anything and that contributes to the ongoing emptiness until we notice more than how we look to others, we will fail to notice the gifts of God and the purpose for God in our lives. We need to hear and keep on hearing Jesus speak to us. And the moment that we think that the words that Jesus is saying are for someone else, we've stopped listening. Where are the words of Jesus for you? Let's continue. While Jesus was still speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside waiting to speak to him. In case you, some people are unaware that after uh, Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had a normal marriage relationship and had other children. And by the way, those brothers were not believers in Jesus until after he raised from the dead. Because how many know it's harder to convince your own family of anything than almost anybody else. And someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. If you look at Mark's gospel about this, what you'll find out is they were actually embarrassed by the attention Jesus was attracting and they were concerned about the things that, they were, that he was saying and they wanted to get him out of that situation. For them, Jesus was not Lord. Jesus was a problem to be solved. And he replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then pointing to his disciples, and this is interesting because that's the word that's used in our translation of scripture. But in the original language, it consists of five words uh, in, uh, in, in Greek. And, and the words are the exact same thing as if you extend your hand towards someone for the purpose of blessing. He extends his hand for blessing and he says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is an uncomfortable family dynamic. 
Sometimes we assume that Jesus' family was, was wonderful. You don't have to do anything other than stare straight ahead right now, but uh, have you ever had a family member embarrass you? Or maybe you're the one that embarrasses them. We're told some really interesting things about Jesus and his brothers. First of all, they're standing. That word is not put there by accident. Matthew includes it on purpose because disciples, when their teacher is teaching, always sit. But they were standing and they're not inside. It also says that they were outside. These members of his family were not all in. In fact, they were close enough to see and hear but not committed. In fact, if anything, they were embarrassed. And they will not become believers in who Jesus is until they see him after his resurrection. Near, not all in. But then he says there are other people in the room. The people who are all in. They're sitting and listening. They don't require proof before they open their ears. They're listening. And while they hear the words of Jesus, they're making some changes in their life. This is going to affect how they live with their spouse or how they parent their children or how they treat their neighbor or how they support the poor or how they treat someone who's injured or sick. It's going to affect their actions. They're not trying to make their lives better. They're listening and following Jesus. Question, what have you heard Jesus say? And how have you responded? And here's what I would say. I'll have the worship team come up. Here's what I would say. I think there's no adventure in proof. I think that as long as we are completely certain, it doesn't lead us to righteousness. It leads us to self-righteousness. It becomes more about establishing that I'm right than anything else. And Jesus didn't come to create a community of faith that was trying to prove we're right and other people are wrong. Jesus is looking for a community that he will consider family. Just if you're willing to open your ears and consider what he's saying and then apply that in some way to your life. If you're looking for proof, a bloody cross and an empty grave are pretty powerful arguments. Yet a lot of people discount those stories by the early disciples. An empty cross and an empty grave are not enough. How can you prove Jesus is who he says he is? Listen. Respond. The proof is what happens in your life after you've done that. That's what makes the difference. God has not come to win an argument. He's come to win your heart. God is not in the business of proving things. He's come to provide a way of salvation. He's not come to take lives. He has come to save lives. How many are grateful for a God like that? Amen? So a cross proves God's love and an empty grave proves his power. But if you want proof for who God is and what Jesus has done, it starts with opening our ears and then responding to what we hear. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, um, <laughs> we hear so many voices. Sometimes we don't have our own thoughts. Would you help us turn our attention away from two-dimensional objects to you. Would you help us hear the words? Even something that has been said today, would you help us hear? That's not just 
PB talking, that maybe Jesus is getting a message through to us and that if we listen and we respond, it changes everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.